Good evening. I'm Bill Doley, the President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and welcome to our ca Archaeology Cafe. So our speaker tonight, uh, Todd Bostwick, uh, probably his uh, long-term uh, claim to fame and, and, and employment was as the city archaeologist up at the, in the city of Phoenix. But Todd is a um, person that I think he once described himself as a workaholic, and he has been busy uh, all over the state and probably gotten busier since he retired from the city of Phoenix job. And so tonight he's bringing a, an example of preservation archaeology, which is what the mission of Archaeology Southwest is about, active research program, sharing information with the public, and protecting archaeological sites uh, for the future. He's going to be talking about a rescued co collection and talking about some of the remarkable things that uh, would have been lost if they uh, hadn't been recovered and brought into uh, a modern context here by an archaeologist like Todd. So Todd, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good evening. Tonight I'm going to talk about the cliff dwellers of central Arizona, and in particular the Verde Valley, which you've probably driven right through on your way to Flagstaff many times. It's a lovely little town. Uh, it's where Fort Verde is located. And uh, the project that I'm going to talk about, as Bill said, is, is a site that was on private land and therefore protected for many years from pot hunters and uh, was then excavated but put in storage and never analyzed or written about. And so for most of you, this will be the first time you've ever even heard of this site. And I'm working on the report, and when that's done uh, early next year, uh, it will be uh, become a famous site, I'm sure, because the materials are some of the best preserved archaeological materials for any site uh, excavated in central Arizona, in fact, probably in, in all of Arizona. The site is called the Dyke Cliff Dwelling, named after the owner, Paul Dyke, who's uh, no longer alive. Uh, it's only nine rooms. It's a very small site. Uh, we know from uh, the analysis of materials that it was dated from about 1050 to 1325, so for uh, almost 300 years. Uh, it was abandoned, though, before the famous site of Tuzigut, which is uh, one of the more well-known sites up in the Verde Valley. Uh, it's a Sanawa site, uh, much like Tuzigut, and also like Montezuma Castle. And in fact, it is located only a couple miles north of Montezuma Castle National Monument, and it could well be that the occupants of the Dyke Cliff Dwelling interacted on a regular basis with those at Montezuma Castle. However, Montezuma Castle uh, was pond hunted extensively before the Park Service took over that uh, famous site. And so the collection from this site uh, really fleshes out what it, life would have been like at the Montezuma National uh, Monument. The site was excavated between 1962 and 1972. Uh, almost serendipity, the archaeologists that excavated it, uh, Dr. Charles was there, and his assistant, George Kritzman, were California archaeologists. Uh, he had his PhD from UCLA, and he just happened to meet the owner of the land, who was a famous artist, and he had an exhibit at the Southwest Museum where Dr. Rosaire was working. And uh, uh, after talking, uh, Dyke uh, convinced Rosaire to come up and excavate the site. And so with volunteers and students, he worked on it off and on, seasonally, and uh, unfortunately, I uh, never wrote it up. I never got it analyzed because he was a very busy archaeologist. He had an active career. But fortunately, the artifacts uh, were preserved, and the collection uh, ultimately was kept intact. And then it was donated to the Verde Valley Archaeology Center, uh, which I'm the director of archaeology at. Uh, as I said, the site is very unassuming. Uh, it had nine rooms. Uh, this is the biggest room. As you can see, not so exciting. Uh, one of the things about the room is that uh, the ceiling started falling in on the inhabitants while they were living there. And you can see these big boulders that the archaeologists had to put 
uh, trees that they cut down to secure the boulders so they could actually excavate around the boulders. <coughs> Excuse me, there was archaeology under the boulders, however, and so uh, they did remove 100% of the site uh, and screened all of it. And because of that uh, screening process, uh, they preserved uh, uh, many of the materials, including very small materials. I point out what one of the storage rooms there, CIST 5i, because this cyst or storage room was sealed when the archaeologists excavated it, and it had not been pot hunted. And so it was a, uh, a storage room that was full, six feet deep of deposits that had been deposited over the period of time. Thank you, Bill. That's just what I need. And had never been... Uh, you know, stripped of the good materials, and so the materials that came out of that particular cis are really spectacular. Here's the architecture. Uh, when I tell you that it's not that exciting when you look at the actual site itself, uh, there's not even masonry. It's just some river cobbles and a lot of mud, enough to make a wall, uh, build a room, <clears throat> and live there from the elements. Uh, but certainly they did not put their artistic effort into the uh, construction of the uh, building itself. There is, however, a very unusual room in it. And it is a uh, natural chamber that's up behind the built rooms. And it's very large. Uh, you could stand up in it. There's a bench in it. There was a wall that was uh, constructed inside it. There are, uh, and it was full of artifacts. And the artifacts uh, are also spectacular. They came out of this room. And the owner who was a renowned Plains Indian expert uh, uh, <clears throat> because he painted them and uh, was uh, married to several and was raised with them, he called this a kiva. And everyone has said, well, yeah, okay, he called it a kiva. But I can tell you, after analyzing the materials, I, I agree with him, it is a kiva. So it was a special ceremonial chamber that was used by the Sanawa. And uh, one of the things that's very interesting is it has these two windows that look out over the Beaver Creek, uh, and these would have acted as ventilators, which is usually one of the criteria of kivas. And there's many other reasons why I do believe it is a kiva. So even though the site itself is not that interesting uh, architecturally, this chamber is very, very important as far as understanding the whole com uh, the Sanawa uh, and their uh, religious activities at the site. One of the spectacular things uh, of... Uh, was a result of analyzing the materials are the plant remains. And having worked in the Southwest for 40 years, most of the plant remains that I've been involved with are little burn up things that you can barely identify and you have to bring specialists in to determine even what it is. But the plant remains that we have at this site are so well preserved that sometimes I joke my audiences that I just went down to the supermarket and picked it up for the show. Uh, because uh, they look like they could have been uh, actually, you know, in your kitchen for a few days. In fact, I've had a number of people ask me, oh, could they still be planted? And uh, that's a good question. And we might even try some experiments and see uh, if that's true, which would be a major discovery because uh, these plant remains are uh, between 600 and 900 years old. We have corn, beets, and squash, the three sisters of the Southwest, uh, the kernels there are yellow. We have three different color kernels, yellow, red, and uh, blue, blue, purple. Uh, most of the kernels are yellow, um, but, but there is uh, a number of blue, purple. And interesting, most of the blue, purple came only from the kiva, uh, which is uh, not surprising because blue, purple uh, colored corn, uh, corn kernels is uh, usually considered as a sacred corn. And just the kernels alone, we had uh, almost 3,500 kernels that were recovered from the screens. And the corn cobs that the kernels came from, over 9,000 corn cobs from this little site. The beans are also very unusual. Beans are rarely found, especially those that are not charred. And we had uh, 176 of these beans in perfect condition. Uh, and interestingly, there are four different species of beans represented. And fortunately, I had Karen Adams, uh, a well-known paleobotanist, working with us, and she was able to 
identify a lot of these materials, and I'm very thankful for Karen's contribution to this project. Uh, the squash, there were over 2,000 squash seeds, uh, three different species, including a hard shell squash that uh, is very good for uh, being uh, preserved through the winter and uh, therefore provides uh, food during the hardest time of the year. And uh, the corn cobs are humongous. Uh, there's a perception out there that most of the corn cobs in prehistoric times were these tiny little nubs, but we have corn cobs from this site that are bigger than the ones you can buy at the supermarket today, which tells us that the uh, climate and the soils uh, and the farming skills of the Sanawa that occupied this site uh, were uh, ideal conditions uh, to be able to grow uh, corn so successfully uh, and to have it in such abundance. All my scales are five centimeters, by the way, in case you're curious. Uh, and the hard shell squash, there was quite a bit of that. Uh, as you can see, there's big pieces of it, stems, uh, rinds, uh, very well preserved. Uh, some of this squash looks very much like the squash that you can buy at the supermarket today. And uh, there was a variety of uh, wild plant products, including uh, walnuts. Uh, there were more than 2,100 walnuts uh, that was recovered from this, those nine rooms. And you can see that some of them are broken and some of them haven't even been broken, probably stored for future use. These are the Arizona black walnuts. They are the wild walnuts. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there's always something you find that makes you scratch your head. We found three English walnut shells mixed among them. And of course, uh, the English walnut is, is, it was not a Sanawa walnut, it was not present, but we're assuming that they were probably lunch of the archeologists that were working at the site. Uh, so there's always surprises that you have to explain. There were a lot of other, uh, uh, wild uh, plant products that they ate. Uh, it was a very abundant diet. They, uh, pinon nuts, uh, acorns, mesquite pods, acacia seeds, juniper seeds, uh, Indian tea or Mormon tea, and even wild grapes. So the Sonawa at this rock shelter, and we assume others uh, that uh, were pot hunted before archaeologists could excavate them, uh, were, were actually uh, living pretty well in the Verde Valley. Uh, we also found uh, cactus uh, products. Just to talk about the preservation, there's an actual prickly pear fruit and the seeds that came from that fruit. Uh, and just in case, uh, to make sure that wasn't the archaeologist's lunch, I had it C14 dated, and you can see it's, uh, it has an intercept date of 1210, which matches the ceramic dates perfectly, so this this prickly pear fruit uh, was picked to be eaten by the Sonawans that were occupying uh, that cliff dwelling. And uh, to find uh, fruit that well preserved, you certainly must be aware how soft these fruits are, is, is absolutely amazing. It's astonishing. And even the pads. Uh, look at the pads there. And they're, they're hard now, but uh, of course, if you just look around uh, at their prickly pears, you'll see that the pads are very soft. Uh, and the fact that they're uh, preserved uh, whole, uh, still with their uh, uh, spines on them, uh, again, reflects on the amazing preservation of this site. We also have a lot of agave that was roasted. Uh, both the, uh, the bases, uh, which is, would have been part of the heart, uh, which is a very important part of the historic Native American diet uh, today, and then also banana yucca fruits. Uh, and so the fruits that look like little mini bananas uh, that grow uh, prevalent all over Arizona uh, also were eaten and apparently are, are very tasty as well. And we have the seeds uh, even from them uh, indicating that they were collecting them right off the plant and then taking them back home and then roasting them just like they roasted the agave. And what I think is really remarkable, we actually have cholla buds with their flowers on them still. I mean, this is just hard to believe uh, that we would find flowers that preserved. Uh, I've got a close-up there of two of the buds. 
uh, with the flowers. I believe there's, these are the preserved flowers for the buds here. And again, that kind of preservation is almost unheard of for an archaeological site. So really amazing. And also the fact that this was collected in a screen and then was handled carefully enough by the archaeologists and then uh, put in storage and then cared for well enough that it made it, uh, you know, 40 years later onto our lab analysis table and still intact is almost a miracle when you consider uh, the history uh, of these archaeological materials. And quids. Now, quids, they say, were the prehistoric chewing gum of the day. Uh, they're either agave or yucca, mostly agave, but also yucca, and even some other plants like corn occasionally, uh, where they cut the leaf of the plant and then chewed and sucked on it to get the juices and the nutrients from the leaves. And then when all that was sucked out, just like a piece of wriggly gum, then you spit it out. And what you spit out is are the fibers that are left. And there were more than 3,000 quids in this little cliff dwelling. So obviously, uh, they were chewing a lot of quids. Although if you think about it, 300 years, 3,000, that's 1,000 a year. You know, it comes down to a few a day, perhaps, uh, pretty much like we would uh, today. But these quids are uh, very valuable research uh, items because recent studies have been analyzing the DNA because the saliva of the individual that chewed those quids is still on those uh, or in them and also uh, individuals have studied uh, what sometimes were wrapped on the inside of them uh, which could be tobacco or other plant products and so they're much more complex than they first appear and uh, so the fact that we have 3,000 and that some person wants to come along and analyze our quids, they're very welcome to do that. Uh, and some really unusual discoveries. Yes, even more unusual than what I've shown you so far. Uh, this was a, a piece of cloth. We had really well-preserved textiles, as you could expect, at the site, because the Snawa were expert weavers and uh, of cotton textiles. And this is a piece of uh, salvaged cotton that had been dyed red and then tied uh, and it had something on the inside. And what's amazing to me is that when we received this, it was excavated in 68. When we received this in 2014, no one had bothered to open it up to see what was inside. And how archaeologists and lab analysts never got the urge to open it is really beyond my comprehension because that was the first thing I did when I got it. As we opened it up, uh, and it was amazing what was inside. There were 31,000 amaranth seeds inside it, wow. in perfect condition. And these seeds have ended up being quite a, a research topic. Uh, Karen Adams has assembled a really impressive team of scientists to look at these seeds to determine if they're domesticated amaranth, which would be a major discovery uh, and then if it was an amaranth that was used for food or if it was used for dye, because we have all these red dyed uh, ceram uh, textiles and we'd really like to know uh, what was the source of that dye and it'd be interesting to see if amaranth was one of the sources of the red dye. Uh, but uh, if you can imagine that a volunteer actually counted those 31,000 something seeds for me. And of course when I asked them, they said, what, you're kidding me, right? And I said, no, we're not. Uh, and then... <laughs> But then Karen is even having somebody measuring uh, a large number of them as well. So we're going to have some amazing data on this uh, really amazing discovery. And uh, we will be publishing an article just on this bag of amaranth seeds because it is such an unusual discovery to be so intact and in such good condition. And in fact, thank God when we got it, we didn't throw out that, that shafty material there. Uh, because Karen tells us that that actually is more important than the seed when you're trying to identify uh, its species. So uh, that's a lesson. Don't throw anything out. We have a lot of salt, uh, which is not surprising because we're only about five miles from the famous Verde salt mine. 
And so I was very curious, so I counted all the salt and weighed it all. And it's interesting because we have almost 11 pounds of salt uh, that was probably all collected from that Verde salt mine. And I'm pretty sure that it's from that salt mine because that Verde salt has a very unique characteristic, which is blue streaks in, in your rock salt crystals. And you can see a beautiful blue streak here. And in fact, uh, that blue colored salt is one of the reasons that the Hopi named the Verde Valley the Blue Valley. Uh, because the blue salt was so famous, so we have have it at the at the site and uh, 11 pounds. I'm thinking, were they eating all that or were they trading? And I suspect they were probably trading it because salt was a very valuable commodity in prehistoric times. Uh, and we have also a really uh, well preserved wooden artifacts of uh, various kinds. Here's just some of the fire drill hearths. Some of you that were Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts remember making a fire the Indian way. And uh, here we have the, uh, the toolkit for making fires. And you can see that some are well used and some are not so well used. Uh, but clearly, fire would have been important. And they didn't have a big lighter, so they had to create their, their own fires. And uh, when I did some research on fire making, I was surprised to find that some Native Americans were so good at lighting fires, that most of them could light a fire in two minutes uh, with with this and, and a, a stick that they would rub uh, to get the spark with some tinder and get a fire going. Uh, we also have um, six wooden bows, uh, four that are large size, two that are smaller size, and then we have another seventh bow that was in process of being made. So we know that they were probably making the bows there at the site. And uh, here's the, one of the ends of the bows showing you that they cut a double notch there for stringing <coughs> uh, the bow. We don't know, <coughs> excuse me, if it was a sinew um, or uh, probably more likely yucca cordage that was used for the bows. But the bows are in excellent condition and have been studied by a bow expert, and uh, he's provided us information about uh, how far they could uh, shoot an arrow and how effective they were. And apparently these bows were only medium effective. Uh, there's actually some better bows that have been found, uh, even in the Verde Valley. And then what was really remarkable were the, were the reed arrows. There were about 70-something reed arrows. It's just a river cane reed and about 40-something of them were painted. Beautiful colors. Uh, and still, as you can see, the color uh, is as, as bright, probably, as when they were first painted. And what's really interesting, because I did a study of these arrows, is that no two are alike. Each one is unique, which is confusing to me, because when you read the literature, they say that, well, we think American Indians painted their arrows so they know uh, whose arrow belonged to who. So if that's the case, why do we have 40-something arrows that are all entirely different then? Uh, and in fact, some of my informants tell me, no, 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 we know which arrow it is. We don't have to paint it to tell whose arrow it is. Uh, it would be important to know which arrow because if several people are hunting, they want to know who actually shot the deer, you know, because they get a larger portion. So uh, there's something uh, to the identity hypothesis, but they're beautiful designs, uh, zigzags, uh, parallel lines, geometric designs. And by the way, <clears throat> uh, this green, this is actually deer sinew that's been painted green. And the arrows uh, were all hafted with uh, split uh, bird feathers. And uh, we still have the portions of the quills. So we know it was three split feathers on each arrow uh, to help with the aerodynamics. And <clears throat> Sinu was used to tie the arrows at the end near the knock. And these knocks are a variety of different kinds. Some are cut, some are plugs that are stuck in. Uh, and so there's uh, quite a bit of variability in how these arrows were manufactured. But they're beautiful uh, nonetheless and really uh, a very special part of the collection. And we even have one of the Eros, it still has one of its uh, feathers on it, and it's a great horned owl feather. 
again, to have this kind of preservation is pretty unusual uh, for central Arizona. And you can see here where the sinew, uh, which is a ligament from a, a, probably a deer, uh, was uh, used to attach the feather. And then uh, the upper part, which is missing, would have attached it here. And this would have been one of the three uh, fletching that would have uh, once been present on this arrow. And a big surprise for me when I studied the four shafts, the arrows are composite arrows, so the shaft is made of reed, and then they use a hardwood four shaft in the end, which they secure with uh, probably pitch, and also occasionally with sinew wrapping, and that was then uh, split at the end to put, to put your uh, stone projectile point, or arrow point. But what really surprised me of the 40-something uh, four shafts that I looked at is that only two of them were designed to have stone arrow points. And we had more than two dozen arrow points from the site. But the vast majority were uh, designed to be used without a stone tip. In other words, they were sharpened uh, so that it would be just the four shaft itself would be the tip of the arrow. And when I looked at the ethnographic literature, I found that that actually was very common. And these kind of arrows would be used for smaller game. Uh, and uh, throughout the Southwest, uh, many uh, groups uh, used uh, sharpened four shafts without stone points. And you can see three different kinds here. Uh, this one in the middle is actually painted red and, and split. And then uh, they painted it again. And this one is barbed. And so we have a variety of different wooden uh, four shafts that are used as the uh, tip of the arrow. And uh, of course, the arrows that were painted, uh, we even have what we think are the paint containers that, that held the paint that was used to paint them. Uh, this is a, a large uh, Phragmites reed, again, a river reed container with a beautiful design that is both burned and painted. Uh, into the uh, reed itself, and then one of the ends was uh, split to create a spout where you could pour the the mineral out. In this case, it's a black uh, mineral. Uh, and uh, then they stop it with uh, some cotton yarn here so that it is secured within the, uh, the, the cane container. And this one uh, started to split, so they put some uh, sinew uh, to secure it and make sure that it stayed intact. And this is really a beautiful, beautiful paint uh, container. And of course, uh, a lot of animal bones because we know that they did uh, hunt animals as well as uh, farm domesticated plants and gathered wild plants. And we have uh, quite a variety of animal bones. Uh, these are just some of the tools uh, they were found, but there were a lot of bones that uh, had been charred or had been boiled. Uh, so we knew that they had cooked the animals as well as used the bones for tools. Uh, there was beaver, deer, coyote, elk, weasel, muskrat, raccoon, rodent, jackrabbit, cottontail, and a variety of birds including uh, quail, duck, teal, and crane. And not surprising, because it's typical for many uh, prehistoric peoples, the cottontail uh, was the most common. So there was a lot of rabbit stew that was eaten at the site. And uh, I've eaten rabbit stew, and it's, it's actually pretty good. So again, it shows you that the, the Sanawa at this uh, cliff dwelling were eating very well. Uh, these are bone owls uh, for making, uh, either working with leather or uh, probably more frequently with making baskets for piercing and splitting your yucca leaves, uh, your processed and dried yucca leaves that the baskets are, were made with. Uh, the hairpin would have been to tie up hair, long hair in the back. As you can see, it's much larger and is highly polished. And uh, of course, there's lots of ceramics. And uh, Sanawa did not make a painted ceramic. They made an undecorated uh, plainware or brownware. And <clears throat> most of the ceramics were 
the non-decorated ceramics, and they were used for utility purposes, storage and cooking and, uh, uh, you know, keeping your water and other liquids. Uh, but they also traded for ceramics that were made outside the region, which uh, tells us a lot about the uh, trade relationship they had. Um, we had more than 30 different imported ceramic types there at that little site. Uh, including ceramics that came from northeastern Arizona, eastern Arizona, uh, from the Prescott area, from the Hocom area to the south, and uh, in in other uh, locations. And um, that those ceramics were very useful in dating the site and also uh, in uh, uh, informing us about who their trade partners were. This this uh, ceramic over here uh, is painted or uh, is a drawing that I did. It's a beautiful uh, cup or a bowl with a handle, and it had azurite, a beautiful blue stain in the bottom. And the reason I'm not showing you a photograph is that this came from one of the child burials. There were uh, four uh, young individuals that were buried uh, within the site. Uh, no adults, uh, only the individuals that were buried beneath the floors. And uh, they had some grave offerings, and one of the... Uh, Infants had this grave offering, and so uh, we will illustrate them because uh, that's a proper procedure to use for burial goods. We have a, a Moenkopi corrugated jar here. Uh, it's been reconstructed um, by the actual archaeologist that dug it. And uh, the corrugated uh, types are another type, but they also came from outside the site, uh, probably from uh, northeastern Arizona as well. And um, this is actually a, a very small jar, um, but it is a, a, an interesting uh, ceramic item. And again, the wood preservation was remarkable. We know they made the local pottery, uh, and we even have the tools that they made the pottery with. Uh, the Sanawa used the paddle and anvil technique uh, to uh, flatten and join the coils that they wrap around the clay coils when they make their vessels. And uh, here's three pottery pa uh, paddles, which are, again, rarely found, uh, completely intact, and were probably used by somebody uh, with great pride and joy and was a treasured object that they kept and, and probably even passed on uh, to their uh, daughters because we assume the women were making the pottery. And, and then they got left behind when they abandon the site, and then the archaeologists uh, get to the light over these uh, pottery panels. And of course, jewelry. And here's a couple items of jewelry. Uh, turquoise in two different colors here. You have the green and the blue turquoise, uh, well polished. And then a beautiful uh, piece of argillite here, which probably came from the Chino Valley north of Prescott. There's a famous prehistoric argillite mine up there. And uh, the archaeologist uh, said they think this looks like a beaver. And considering that it came from uh, Beaver Creek, no one wants to argue with him. <laughs> I'll let you use your imagination if you think it's a beaver too. Uh, it, clearly it's a zoomorph of some kind, and uh, it's, it's a very interesting uh, piece of jewelry. And of course, uh, clay figurines. And here are uh, three examples. Uh, one is a human head, a dog, and possibly a fox or some other quadruped, four-legged mammal. And the Sanawa are not famous for their figurines, like the Hokam, but they are few found at every site. And it's even been suggested that it was the children that made the figurines in the Sanawa culture. And somebody's done a study and looked at fingerprints and noted that they're uh, the size of children uh, to support the idea that children were making these. But they also point out that even if children were making them, they were still used probably for ritual purposes, fertility and other uh, you know, purposes. And the, uh, the human head actually looks very similar to other ones I've seen in the Prescott area. And so there may be uh, a connection to the Prescott area. We do have Prescott pottery that's present at the site, so we know there was a connection with the people of the Prescott uh, region.
and there is even some intact basketry. This is a completely intact uh, yucca ring basket. In other words, there's a stick that is tied in a circle, and then the yucca uh, st uh, strips from yucca leaves are woven around the ring, and it's called a sifter sometimes. And it was really surprising to me to unwrap this because I have a Hopi Mate sifter basket that looks exactly like this that I collected in the Hopi Mesas about 20 years ago. And so and we do believe that the Sunawa are uh, related to the Hopi and are probably are uh, one of their ancestors. And so it's not surprising to find objects that, that look very Hopi-like. And then there's a beautiful woven basket here, as you can see. Uh, it's exceptionally well made uh, out of uh, uh, Phragmites cane strips and it's a container and inside are corn cobs, some with holes and uh, I thought why would you make a basket uh, of this skill uh, requirement uh, just to put six corn cobs in when you've got 9,000 of them at your site uh, but it just so happens that uh, we have a lot of corn cobs with sticks in them. And at first, of course, everyone joked, oh, they like to eat corn on the cob. And and, and may well be. But also, uh, I learned uh, through my informants that the Hopi have a game uh, that they use corn cobs with sticks and then a feather in the other end to play a dart game. So these might actually be used in, in a game and are not actually corn on the cob. Um, it shows you you have to be careful to take literal interpretations of things sometimes without further information. Uh, Well-preserved sandals. Here's a sandal with the back curved up. And you can see the uh, way the, the sandal was strapped to the foot, made out of tough yucca fibers. Here's uh, uh, a piece of cordage that was made into a rope. And this rope could be bought at a hardware store today. It's so well-preserved. It's just an amazing piece of, of cordage. And we have more than 5,000 pieces of cordage from the site. Again, anyone interested in studying cordage, come on up. Uh, we have beautiful yucca, uh, cordage yucca nets. And for all kinds of purposes, for hunting, for holding containers. And uh, we actually analyzed all the knots and determined the kind of knots that they were tying. Uh, and there were four different kinds of knots they were using. And so it provided a lot of information about how they made nets. Uh, there was even one rabbit skin blanket. And most of the rabbit fur has been eaten off by, by rodents. Uh, but it is a rabbit skin blanket. And it's the first rabbit skin blanket ever found in Verde Valley. So that was a, a major discovery in the Kiva, I might add. Uh, even a turkey feather cordage that may have been part of a turkey feather uh, garment or, or blanket. Uh, so we have uh, really um, you know, important and valuable uh, weaving items. And we have a wooden flute uh, that was broken, apparently eaten by the rats. Uh, but during its use, it, the end broke, and so they took some leather and they repaired it. We have a rattle that's in incredible condition. Uh, in fact, it's completely intact. Those are those are gourd uh, pieces of gourd, cut gourd, with probably uh, pebbles inside. It still works. Here's an illustration to give you an idea. Uh, the handle is one solid piece of wood uh, covered with uh, cotton textile and then wrapped uh, in cordage uh, with knots. It's just a really unusual and spectacular uh, sample of a rattle. Uh, we have a lot of wooden wands, which were probably used in rituals. Uh, this one uh, is very interesting to me because its head is in the shape of a of an animal, which is actually not unusual. Uh, there are we have one with a snake and one that looks like it might be a human head. Uh, really special wooden artifacts. Uh, we have a lot of cotton, and more cotton than, than almost any other site in central Arizona. We have. Uh, bundles of raw cotton. We have cotton bowls. We have cotton seeds. I've been working with Karen on the cotton there, and it's a truly uh, spectacular collection. Uh, we have more than 800 cotton seeds. 
Uh, and then that does include the cotton seeds that are in the fiber bundles. And so there's more than a thousand cotton seeds, which is one of the largest collection of prehistoric cotton seeds uh, found at a site in Arizona. Uh, and we have this, the uh, spindle whorls, uh, both wood discs and modeled clay. And here you can see how Hopi is spinning his cotton by using one of these spindle whorls. And uh, look at this. We have a ball of cotton yarn that some individual has used the spindle whorls to spin the yarn and then to wrap the yarn into a ball for future use. If I didn't know that this was actually dug by a reputable archaeologists, I would question uh, the existence of this as a prehistoric ball of cotton yarn. Uh, just an amazing uh, artifact uh, that is so rare to find something in this kind of condition. But it fits in with the rest of the collection. Uh, and, and this is really neat. It's actually cotton yarn that's attached to a cactus needle that's been split and then tied so that the thread is put through the eye of the needle so then it can be used to repair the textiles. They did not embroider anything, but they repaired the textiles over and over and over again. And obviously, they needed a lot of needles. We have more than 30 uh, agave spine needles that were used for repairing the textiles and you can see they just used the end of the agave leaf and then they wove in the cotton yarn here and that way they could use it uh, as a very effective needle for uh, mending the textiles. And we know they were weaving because we have uh, at least 14 wooden uh, battens that are used in a loom. So we know they're weaving on a loom at the site and uh, the uh, it, there's there were two that were actually tied together that came from the kiva again, uh, which I I believe that there's good evidence that they were weaving inside the so-called kiva at the site. Uh, here's some of the textiles. You can see uh, we have a lot of plain weave, such as this tie at the top. In fact, we have more than a thousand pieces of plain weave textiles from the site. Uh, remarkable collection. And some of it is red, and here's a piece of red, plain weave. And in fact, if you look close at that, it looks like it has a black stamp design in it. And it's faded, so, uh, you know, some of us have said, well, hard to tell. Uh, but then we have this piece of plain weave textile that's been dyed red, and then it has a black design that was painted on it. So it's a textile that's woven in white, and then dyed red, and then painted with geometric designs in black. And we, uh, the black, because it's painted, it doesn't last long, so it started to fade. So we put this through a de-stretch program, which is a computer program, and you can see here that the, uh, the design is quite elaborate. It's interlocking hook design, which, by the way, is a very common motif at this site and at other Sanawa sites as well. Uh, we also have uh, more than a dozen breech cloths, all of them well used. <laughs> and I, I, I say that uh, with great reverence uh, because this was somebody's personal item. Many of them were folded up and then were put away in that storage room that was sealed. So obviously it was important that they be retired uh, ritually and then never seen again. But you know, that's what we do as archaeologists. We like to reveal the secrets of the past. Uh, by the way, that's the most breech cloths ever found at a Sanawa site. And one of them is very interesting. Both of them, actually this one here, there, this is the belt that wraps around to secure it. And at the very end, there's a beautiful little a decorative design here uh, with the weft technique, which is a supplemental. In other words, they add color thread in there. And we had a, a Zuni weaver look at this and said, what's going on here? And he says, oh, that's the personal identification mark for that person's breech cloth. So when all the guys go down to go swimming and they get out, they know which breech cloth belongs to who. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, we also have these beautiful weft wrap open work textiles that are extremely sophisticated, very difficult to make, and have beautiful decorative designs that are created by these open holes we have 16 pieces of these, which is a large collection, although I suspect several of them are probably the same 
garment, possibly a shirt. And uh, it's, uh, it's so complicated, we're having a hard time figuring out exactly how they were wrapping these holes. Uh, we also have a beautiful piece of gauze with supplemental weft in it. And you can see uh, the design here is really beautiful. Uh, we have to illustrate some of these things to really bring out the details. And uh, we have really unusual brown tie-dyed cotton. Uh, there's only a few examples, in fact, about 16 or so examples that are known from the Southwest, and we had six of them that we're going to add to that collection. And these designs, by the way, are uh, what's called the dot and square our corn kernels. And these are very important uh, ritual garments. And uh, this is actually half of one that is folded. Here's a picture of a Hopi clan matriarch wearing one of these garments at Awadavi, uh, which is, uh, was a very famous, uh, is still a very famous Hopi site. Uh, and this was from one of their kivas there that was studied in the 1950s, uh, just to show you uh, how one of these would have been worn and how important that they would have been. In fact, probably passed on among uh, the younger generations uh, until they no longer be used. Here's another example of a plain weave uh, with interlocking uh, hook design. Uh, and then here's one just to give you an idea of the colors that still exist in some of these textiles. Uh, it's just uh, staggering to look at some of these textiles and the colors have faded very little, even though this is anywhere from six to 900 years old. Uh, again, interlocking hook design there. Beautiful, beautiful work, just absolutely beautiful. And this is a diamond twill tapestry, which is a fairly sophisticated uh, weaving technology. And again, this is found from the Kiva. And uh, whoever owned this garment would have been a very important person. So it's not surprising that it was in the Kiva. Uh, and then here we have a slit tapestry belt. And uh, as you can see, uh, really amazing uh, colors. And uh, the work that's went into this is uh, enough to make you uh, salivate, actually. Um, and, and I'm salivating right now every time I see this. Uh, it's, and it has all those colors and this interlocking uh, design. Uh, wow. That's all I can say. It's just wow. It's really given us appreciation of the skills. And we had a, we had a, uh, a Tewa uh, Piero uh, master weaver from New Mexico come in, uh, came in, a uh, well-known uh, and he uh, told us that uh, there was a master weaver at, at our site, uh, really a truly skilled weaver, and we have all the evidence. And so that's just a brief summary of the spectacular collection from the Dyke Cliff Dwelling. Thank you very much. Absolutely incredible. Can you imagine if that collection had not been preserved and what, it, so thank you for what you people have been doing. So we have time for questions here. Uh, audience members, I've got, I'll bring you the uh, microphone and let you direct the question. Can you tell me, do, did they use those arrows more than once? Yes, and they're designed that way. Because if the tip breaks off, they can remove the foreshaft and put a new foreshaft in it. Okay. So that preserves the shaft part for for many uses. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Was this an actual settlement, and how many people do you think live there? Well, you know, it's hard to say being occupied over 300 years and whether all the rooms were used at the same time, but... It was probably not more than uh, 30 people, uh, if that much. Yeah, it was a small group of people. It's not a very big cliff dwelling, and that's why it, it's so remarkable that it has this diversity of materials and materials that would have been very valuable uh, commodities uh, in that time period present in, in such a small, unassuming site. And I argue that that's probably because uh, that Kiva was there. It was a very important site. Uh, a religious site, and so uh, the individuals that controlled the activities in the Kiva 
probably were very important individuals in the larger community. Um, um, how, how long did it take for you to get this, um, these resources? How long did it take? You? Four years. Four years. Four years. Wow, that's nice. Yes. Can you not tell uh, what the dyes were? For instance, did they use cochineal? Do you know? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we There is no evidence that cochineal, the insects, were used for red dye in the southwest. Uh, uh in the prehistoric times, we know in the historic times they did, and but that's a big debate. We were not even sure if it was organic or mineral. People assume the red is probably mineral from uh, an iron-based, uh, but very few studies have been done. And in fact, I'm working with somebody from the Arizona State Museum uh, to do some studies to determine what what is the source of the dye. Uh, but that's a very good question that we're we're still researching. Yes. Okay, you mentioned that the arrow reeds, uh, the shafts were were reeds. Were they all Phragmites? They were and, all and, Phragmites. And I'm wondering if Phragmites still grows in the site today. Uh, it grows all up and down the Verde River, uh, which is uh, the Beaver Creek is a tributary of the Verde River. Yes, it's very it's very common. In the room that you identify as a kiva, was there a super food? No, uh, that none that was recognized by the excavators, but uh, it was pretty mucked up, and there was up to three foot of archaeological deposit that they had to remove, plus a lot of the ceiling had come down to. And in fact, I'll use uh, that question to comment now, why do I think they left? Because they got sick of the rocks from the ceiling crashing down on their, on them, and they felt it was dangerous, and and so they left. It's also a time of reorganization in the Sinawa society. So when they were unhappy with the ceiling, uh, and other individuals were uh, moving and coalescing in big sites, somebody said it's time, time to go. You showed us a, a drawing. Uh, of a cup from a burial site rather than a photograph? Correct. Could you uh, speak a little bit about uh, how archaeologists approach The Native Americans uh, would prefer that we not use photographs for burial offerings. So uh, we don't. We don't take photographs of the materials and we don't display photographs. We just uh, do illustrations for uh, scientific recordation purposes. So Linda's been monitoring our Facebook crowd, and she's got a question from somewhere outside of the building. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I've got two related questions from the same gentleman um, who says did a great job. But he says, um, is there a plan to display this collection publicly? And as a follow-up, how can people support your work, this work? Very good questions. Yes, a small portion is on display at the Verde Valley Archaeology Center in Camp Verde. And that museum is open uh, uh, weekly, and there's no admission. And so you can come in and see we rotate a collection. I've been working on a report, a huge report that should be done this spring. That will have hundreds of photographs of uh, everything that you've seen here and more in that report. And the second question was, uh, if you'd like to make any donations for the publishing of that report I talk about, uh, we would be uh, very glad to accept them. And the report then will be distributed and for sale at the uh, uh, Verde Valley Archaeology Center, verdevalleyarchaeology.org. Hello. Um, I was wondering, you would have shown it, but I was wondering if there were any painted wooden artifacts other than these more along the line of, say, altar slabs um, that, you know, would have been used perhaps in the Kiva or other? Uh, not not in the sense that you're thinking, no. Uh, the really, uh, the only really good examples of painted wood would have been the arrows uh, and that uh, reed uh, paint container, yeah. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much. Can you say um, how you think these materials were so well preserved? Well, uh, uh, the National Park Service did a LIDAR map. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. Those are the maps done with 
radar that's very accurate. And they showed that all the rooms were behind the drip line. And there was a very thick midden with the artifacts that were, people were thrown out. We don't, I don't like to use the word trash because the Native Americans don't think of it as trash. And so that, those deposits were in some cases up to five feet thick. And they were dry and they stayed dry and uh, only a few pot hunters got in there. So it was the right uh, combination of reasons uh, that, that thankfully preserved everything. If you think that only a few dozen people lived there at any time, then there's Kiva there. Could you say talk any about the surrounding culture? Yes. Well, I uh, had argued uh, in the concluding chapter that the site was part of a, a community of other sites that interacted and probably this kiva served as a, uh, a ritual location for other sites that were occupied up and down the Beaver Creek. And I recently uh, came across a new study uh, that's been done that suggested that Beaver Creek had two Sonawa communities. And we would have been right on the edge of one of them that included Montezuma Castle. So it could be that, in fact, uh, our site served as a religious node for the community that surrounded the, the uh, Montezuma National Monument site. Thank you very much for this talk. Have you, you identified the wood of the bows? The wood is probably uh, ash or hackberry, um, but surprisingly wood is actually very difficult to identify if it hasn't been cut. So you can get a cross section of the grains and all of our wood is so well preserved, and I don't dare cut any of them. Uh, so we're kind of guessing on the wood species, yeah. You showed us a small figure of a dog. I wonder, is there any evidence of other domesticated animals that were used by this culture? Uh, the only domesticated animal we know the Sanawa had, as did all the other uh, Native Americans of North America and Central and South America, was the dog. Well for North America anyway, excuse me. Um, and uh, some of the bones that we identified as coyote are often with a slash dog because they're difficult. So it may be that we did have some dog bones uh, in there from a dog that lived at the site and then died. Uh, interestingly, uh, I excavated a site actually in Marana a few years ago and we had a lot of dog bones. And when we looked carefully at them, none of them had been butchered and in fact, when I looked at the literature, uh, we, the, we don't believe that the Holcom or other Native Americans ever ate their dogs, which is uh, counter to what we know about uh, further south in Mesoamerica. They were uh, companions, loyal companions, were used as hunters. So it's possible there, there may have been uh, some dogs present uh, in, in the skeletal remains that we had. Yes. You we would expect that they would have been there. You said that is this on? Yeah. You said that uh, the the re uh, there was never a published report, but what was how uh, what was the quality of the documentation? Well, the uh, uh, Dr. Roser was a skilled archaeologist, and he excavated in five by five foot uh, squares and six inch levels, and we have all of his original field notes, and so it's it's a little bit mixed up, but. After several years, I've been able to figure out where pretty much everything came from in three dimensions within the cliff dwelling. Yes. Uh, so we're very fortunate that not only is it a remarkable collection, but that a very skilled archaeologist excavated it. I have a question about the cotton. Um, this is something that I'm not very well versed in, but I'm wondering, was cotton grown throughout this area and woven? Uh, yes, uh, it was. We know that cotton came into the Southwest as early as AD 200, AD 300. And then uh, the Hoakam, the people of this culture here uh, that lives in Tucson and Phoenix area, became expert cotton farmers and weavers 
unfortunately, the, the textiles were not did not preserve very well, so we don't have a very good record of it. But we know they grew cotton. In effect, they probably traded cotton up north. And it appears that about A.D. 1000, uh, a strand of cotton was developed that could grow in shorter growing climates where it, it's a little cooler and, and the winters are rougher. And so after about 1000 uh, A.D. in the Verde Valley, maybe 1100 up on the Colorado Plateau, uh, those people started growing cotton too. And sure enough, uh, you know, the, the dike cliff dwelling was occupied in the 10 hundreds and we have all this cotton so it fits that uh, they were taking advantage of the, the ability to grow cotton uh, in, you know, sizable quantities in the Verde Valley. And then, and then all the tools clearly indicate their weaving and then of course we have the, the textiles as well. Yes, that, one I showed you is typical size, uh, not real big, um, and but you know, big enough. Yeah. Uh, would you address the concept of uh, the trash and the accumulation of trash? You know, in terms of how the prehistoric Native Americans accumulated all these things and didn't just throw them far distances away. Well, I, I. I mentioned that uh, some Native Americans don't like the word trash because that imp implies that it's worthless and uh, has no value and is being rid of. But uh, for many Native Americans, everything that's used by a human is alive and stays alive and uh, deserves respect and care. And even if you put materials that you're no longer using into a trash mound or a midden, it uh, doesn't mean that it's not important anymore or that uh, the objects are not don't have a living uh, presence. It just means that you've put them in a place where you've essentially retired them. Uh, it's a different concept of what trash means. And I, I like the concept because it, 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 you know, it, it really makes you realize that there are many people in the world who, who realize that uh, once something is used by a human, the, the, the life of that human is in, in, embedded in that object and it never leaves it. And so that object should always be respected, whatever its condition or whether it's still used or not. It's a spiritual perspective on objects that are not in use. Did that answer your question? So we've got time for one more question here. Okay. I always seem to be interested in the things that people don't want to talk about. And I'm wondering if you can describe that cup came from a burial site. Were they cremated? Were they buried? What position were they in? Can you tell me any more without offending someone? Uh, I can give you some general information. Yes, they were not cremated. The whole come early in their sequence cremated people, but the Sanawa buried them extended in a grave in a pit. They dug a pit, put the individual in the pit, uh, laid them out, and then put burial offerings around the individual. Uh, often with the children, they would wrap them in textiles and maybe even put some uh, reed matting over them or wrap them in reed matting and then cover it up. So there was great care and respect that went into the burials, but they were extended burials, yes. Inhumations uh, versus cremations. Todd, thank you very much. This has been a remarkable uh, presentation about things that we rarely get to see. Thank you.